Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Indian Nuclear Society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Session Chair and Mr. Session Co-Chair for the invitation, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here from Switzerland. I work for the uh, company called Transmutex, and in its name is Transmutation, and you probably know all about it. So I'm very proud and honored to be here. Thank you very much. Right away, <clears throat> what is the mission of the company? The mission is to reinvent nuclear, in, nuclear energy for civilian use. Our concept is that if you can use subcritical systems with thorium, and that's why we're in India, um, when we can have lower cost, you can have sustainable fuel cycle, and very important, not mentioned very often, we can have non-proliferating uh, nuclear energy. And if nuclear energy is going to spread worldwide, I believe one of the major characteristics that we need to address is non-proliferation. Why do we need nuclear energy? Well, this chart to me says it all. In the United Arab Emirates, they started the renewable uh, project at the same time as the nuclear project. Many people say nuclear takes a long time, it's too costly, it's going to be over budget and over time. But in the United Arab Emirates, where there is as much sun as you want and as much space as you want, Nuclear energy in the same span of time, a decade, produces twice as much energy as renewables. And this is the magic of nuclear if we can deliver it on time, on budget, as the Koreans have done for the United Arab Emirates. The problem with expanding nuclear energy three times, as it was decided in the COP28, is waste. It's also something that very few people addressed. Thank you to our colleagues at Rosatom for putting this on the forefront. But in the US, you can see that Yucca Mountain, which has not been built, actually has been canceled, would have been filled with all the waste produced up to 2015. And a Yucca Mountain would have cost $96 billion if the United States increases by three times nuclear energy based on uranium, then they will have to build one Yucca Mountain repository every decade. So on top of the cost of developing nuclear energy, you will have to develop deep geological depositories that are incredibly expensive and socially unacceptable, as we have seen in many countries except the Nordic countries, which have all this space that nobody wants in the northern latitudes. So we need to deal with the waste issue, the non-proliferation issue, and of course, it would be much better if the cost was lower. So what do we have when we compare uranium to thorium fuel cycle? Today, you need to mine a lot of uranium in order to get enough uranium-235 to be able to make enriched fuel at 5%, that which then you burn into your uh, heavy, I mean, water reactor, and you get a lot of uh, depleted uranium, fission products, a little bit, of course, of long-lived nuclear waste, but it's very long-lived and it's very problematic because it interacts very well with water. And so if you have water leaks in your deep geological depository, you will contaminate the water for hundreds of thousands of years, which is not, a, which is not something we should trifle with. Okay? If you do the same calculation with thorium, well, basically, you, it's much more efficient on the ore level. The mining is, of course, much simpler for thorium. And uh, you don't need really to enrich it. You can have 1% enrichment, and you burn it into your heavy water reactor, sort of like can do, but for, for, for thorium. And you are able to recycle, because in the heavy water reactor, you breed enough new uranium-233 that if you have the right recycling, you can continue the cycle almost forever. 
And in the end, you have mostly fission products. We don't produce, if it's fully thorium, uranium-233, then you produce very, very minimal, negligible amount of uh, plutonium and transuranic. Okay? The problem with the thorium fuel cycle is here. How do we get uranium-233, which doesn't exist in nature? That is really the key. How do you start? the whole process. If we could start the process, the two challenges are starting the process of getting uranium-233 and getting the recycling right. Otherwise, it's been proven. Basically, we had a shipping port, a core that was replaced from uranium to thorium by changing the vessel, and that functioned for five years non-stop, produced twice as much electricity as was planned, and did load following faster than fossil fuel plants. Faster than fossil fuel plants. One of the issues is that the report published by the DOE was published on March 1986. It was one month before Chernobyl. So this report went completely under the radar. But otherwise, it basically states in its introduction that thorium would provide the nation's total energy requirement for centuries. This is the conclusion of the Department of Energy. But of course, we entered from Chernobyl and then Fukushima, unfortunately, what we can call the nuclear winter. Unfortunately, uh, that was true for the industry. So what do we propose? We propose a subcritical transmuting accelerated reactor technology that we call START. I think we found the right letters because we like the idea that it's going to start the thorium fuel cycle. It's a combination that you know very well from anybody who knows about accelerator driven system. We use a cyclotron. And of course, a spallation target, Mr. Session Chairman explained it very well. And after that, a metal fuel. That is not so self-evident. We chose metal because it's much easier to recycle. And of course, we chose a fast neutron reactor based on lead. We know the experience in France with sodium-cooled reactors. You have a sodium-cooled reactor here in India. The Russians have a sodium-cooled reactor. There is a lot of benefits from sodium a lot of benefits, but everything is in the detail. And for us, the safety issue of thorium makes it impossible to really spread around. I think it will remain very accessible for research reactors and with military applications, but it is really complicated to manipulate compared to lead. And one of the important breakthrough, which is the same as the BREST project for Rosatom in Russia, is that we have the reprocessing and uh, manufacturing of fuel on site. So this is based on the concept of the integral fast reactor from Argon National Lab in the, US, in the USA, which wanted to do everything on site, which Rosatom is now doing with the BREST project. And um, we chose a cyclotron to answer uh, Mr. Session Chairman's uh, question. First of all, we don't have a 1 MeGV uh, because 800 is just above the elbow of the spallation efficiency. So uh, between 800 and 1 GV, we don't get a huge gain in spallation efficiency. And therefore, we prefer to be at the lower end of the energy to uh, have lower cost. And 5 milliamp. Um, with high reliability. We are based on the Paul Scherer Institute cyclotron design, which already reaches 600 MeV with 2 milliamps. So it is not a huge extension. And we have a deep partnership with them so that we can benefit from their design. And we already have the blueprints for our cyclotron. We already have the simulation and we already have done tests of reliability at the Porsche Institute on their cyclotron. So we believe we have solved the cyclotron power and reliability. Of course, we need testing, but 
at, at this point, even the PSI people are in agreement with us. We do have a four megawatt pure, pure molten met lead, not lead bismuth. It is not like Mira in Belgium at all, or like C uh, A I D S in China. Uh, we have an entirely we reinvented the concept of the of the target in a. Uh, what we are going to fight for patent and uh, our simulations have been very positive. What's important is that it's much, much simpler and it can be cooled. The four megawatt target problem is how do you cool the target? We have chosen metal fuel with Argonne National Lab and we have a fuel, we've designed a fuel that would not swell. Uh, which is one of the issues with the, uh, uh, of course, as you, as you know, for, for fuel um, pellets. And we use pyro processing, which enables us to reprocess the fuel while it's still hot. So we only have the fuel in the um, used fuel pool for 1.5 years instead of 5 to 10 years. And then we can reprocess quite quickly. This is our concept. How does it, how could it be useful uh, for the world? For India, together with the expertise of India, we can expand around the world. First of all, we take thorium and long-lived waste, which is a real issue for most countries that have nuclear today. Not only do we take plutonium, but we take americium, which most fast critical reactors will not be able to accumulate. Because we're subcritical, we can have much more higher concentration of plutonium and americium. And americium is the most problematic minor actinide for deep geological storage after 500 years. We can breed in our reactor for uranium-233 while we produce electricity. I just want to make a note that it's the opposite of enrichment of uranium which takes a lot of energy and doesn't get any energy out. Here, the magic is that you can produce uranium-233 while you make electricity or heat. And then, during our process of power processing, we get pure thorium-232 together with uranium-233. And we just need then to add more thorium. We don't enrich, it's the opposite. We lower the concentration of uh, uranium-233 in order to put it into heavy water reactor. Then we re the remaining, because we cannot burn all the plutonium and americium, of course, so the remaining is actually comes out. We could jumpstart the three-stage program with a very efficient method of producing uranium-233 that then you can use into your heavy water reactors. One of the advantages of this whole program is you breed uranium-233, which then you can make as fuel. But while you do that, you make electricity, which you can sell, or heat, of course. When you make the calculation, and these calculations were compared and checked by the Swiss nuclear operators, you realize that even though our cost uh, of uh, installing the the plant initially is higher than for the same amount of energy, we do have some waste revenue, and even if our operation and personal costs are higher, much higher, you know, and if our loan repayments are higher, because we have some revenue from waste management and we have uh, lower fees for long-lived waste, we have the same profitability as a regular nuclear reactor. So while you're breeding uranium-233, which will feed the fleet of thorium-based heavy water reactor, you will make money. Not only that, but if you compare the thorium fuel cycle to the uranium fuel cycle, we believe we are even lower. So not only do we make money from the during the breeding of uranium-233, but if I take that out, I believe, I mean, we believe that extracting thorium ore is going to be much cheaper than uranium, especially that we have now 
more difficult access to mines because the easier part of uh, the uranium mines have been exploited. So we estimate that it's going to be 10 times more expensive to mine uranium than to get your uh, thorium. We estimate it's going to be the same to get pure thorium or pure uranium. It's going to cost the same amount of money. There is no enrichment for the thorium fuel because it comes out of the pyro processing pure enough that you can almost put it directly into the uh, heavy water reactor. But this is the cost of the enrichment proportionally to the cost of extracting the ore. We think that the fabrication of thorium fuel because of the problem of uranium-232 and the high gamma emission and everything is going to be three times more expensive than the fabrication. It probably needs to be remote certainly needs to be remote, it's going to be more expensive. So we estimate it's going to be three times. And then we have less fuel storage, but not very much, but still we have much less plutonium and, uh, and minor actinides, therefore it's cheaper. So overall, when you make the comparison, thorium fuel cycle is going to be at least 30% cheaper than the uranium fuel cycle. And this is just from the beginning. It will be optimized down the road. So, not only do you make money by making uranium-233, but on top of it, the whole process of making the thorium fuel for heavy water reactor will be cheaper. Transmutex has a huge ambition to reinvent an entire fuel cycle, along with what the vision for India was. We believe that the way to do it is to bind the world together which is the vision I heard also during the last three days. We are in an emergency. The whole point is to get together and to make this happen as fast as possible. What we have done over the last four years is to bring the best science institutions together to combine their expertise in the different field. So we have Argon National Lab and soon Los Alamos, Argon National Lab in the USA for the pyro processing and we have designed with them the flow chart for the uh, reprocessing of the thorium fuel. And they have determined that it will be non-proliferant and we can prove it to any authority. We have in France the National Center for Research, Scientific Research, and AGIS, which has a very strong presence here in India, 3,500 people for engineering. We have, of course, CERN in Geneva, Polsia Institute, and also the Polytechnic Institute of Lausanne for uh, a lot of the software. They have a very strong nuclear engineering uh, master program, and we often uh, welcome their students, but we also have sponsored a PhD student which is doing cutting edge research on software for digital twins, uh, very, very low cost digital twins. In Sweden, we work with Stutzvik, who is the, uh, the main agency for, many, for management of waste. In Poland, with the National Center for Nuclear Research, which has a very advanced laboratory for material science. In Germany, we work with the German safety authority called TÜV North and the Technical University of Munich, with whom we are doing a study on how partitioning and transmutation will impact the storage of nuclear waste in Germany. But now, in Germany, we are also talking about the possibility of doing a research reactor to prove that we can destroy nuclear waste for the long term. In Italy, we are working with the National Agency for uh, Atomic Energy and with Ansaldo Nuclear, which are the European leaders in lead-cooled reactors. In fact, we took the design of the Ansaldo nuclear lead-cooled reactor and we've expanded it and we've, we've uh, customized it to make it subcritical. And of course, we sincerely hope we will be able to work with BARC uh, in India for all the expertise that uh, there is in India for thorium at many, many levels and many other things, of course, accelerators and, and nuclear engineering in, in general. So, uh, we hope that when we, soon we will be able to have a, a full collaboration. 
our strategy, we are a private company, we raised money on our own, we are not publicly financed, no government has ever given us money, is to make it as cheap as possible. We were great admirers of how India sent a rocket to the moon for $75 million. I think nobody believed me when I said that number, but you know, it's been very impressive. So we are very much in the same um, um, mind that we need to make things cheap. And the problem with nuclear is that it's very expensive. New Scale spent $1.8 billion before they failed. And every other nuclear company in the US is spending tons of, of money to do testing with real hardware. What we focused on from the very beginning has been software and simulation software. We are very proud to have our own Monte Carlo code. We took the open source software from CERN and we modified it to make it nuclear. CERN has no right to work on nuclear energy. That is there in their constitution. So we took that over and made it a nuclear energy software. And we have now what we believe is the most advanced Monte Carlo code that works on the cloud and therefore we can accelerate maybe by 100 or 1,000 times so that we can do simulations very, very quickly on complex geometries. We also have our own digital twin software based on open source through the Ecole Polytechnique Lausanne. That way we can do full simulations on the very cheap and we can push as far as possible all the testing that we need to do in hardware. We have an excellent team of course, uh, Mr. Donovan Mer, the Chief Technology Officer here, uh, to, uh, he was the first employee and uh, he uh, can answer any of your questions also afterward. We have now 35 employees, 24 are PhDs and we have 12 nationalities. Among them, we're very proud to have uh, one Indian, uh, very high senior engineer who is here also with us, and um, Dr. Varma. And uh, so, and but we have Hungary, we have uh, we have Italians, French, uh, Germans, uh, Polish, uh, all kinds of European, and 25% um, women. What are the other key opportunities for the overall technology? Accelerator, lead-cooled reactors, re reprocessing. Of course, high-energy physics simulation software. That's our software. We have now we're receiving strong interest from, for it. Of course, as you know, everybody does that. But we will have some of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, cyclotron accelerators in the world with very high efficiency. Industrial scale radioisotope production because the more power, the more, the faster you can produce isotopes. Of course, nuclear waste free processing, and because we use uh, molten lead, we can do high temperature industrial uh, process. We received 35 million dollars equivalent in funding, and maybe you will probably don't know those names, but they are incredibly famous in the U.S. This is a fund that is more than 20 years. And every year, they had at least two IPOs in the US, which is the measure of success for financial uh, institutions like that. In France, we have Hardware Club, which is uh, very close to the CEA and has invested in some of the most cutting edge uh, deep tech companies. And we have At One Ventures, which is the climate fund that has been originally backed by the co-founder of Google. Um, so we have some of the, the best, um, most forward-looking venture capital funds that are backing us and uh, we're very, very proud of that. It shows the, those people don't invest in any company. I can tell you that it takes a long time to convince them and when they look around, uh, then if they invest, it shows that whatever you're, pro you're proposing is very serious and that we have uh, a very strong future. We also have the strong support of the scientific community. Of course, we have the Paul Scher Institute, we have uh, CERN, we have Argonne, Los Alamos, uh, Enea, all these people. But individually, I'm very, very proud. And he will be in our office again uh, in three weeks, four weeks. Now is uh, Gérard Moreau, who is at Ecole Polytechnique, which uh, Mr. Session Chairman knows very well. Uh, uh, he is, of course, the Nobel Laureate in 2018. 
and he loves this project. He's met the team several times, and he states that the Transmutex project is scientifically proven, technologically credible, and led by an exceptional team, I would have to say, technical team, and that humanity needs, uh, needs their success as soon as possible. So that's why we call on, on you, on the DAE, on the staff at BARC, to please help us. We would love to collaborate with you. We need you to make the world move forward and to that, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to present to you um, a, a way to go forward together for non-proliferant, lower cost energy around thorium for the world, not just for India, for the world. Thank you very much.